So welcome everyone to uh, this meeting of the travel group. And um, before we get the meeting started, I uh, want to acknowledge that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm sure many of you are coming from other parts of unceded territory. Um, so today we're pleased to have Graham Wynn, who's going to talk to us about New Zealand. And he has a long history of going to New Zealand, I understand. So I'm going to hand it over to Graham. And uh, Graham, perhaps you could introduce yourself briefly and then uh, carry on with the procedure. And I'll let you share the screen at this time, please. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, you run a tight ship and I'm glad to see we're starting right on time. I'll just very quickly set up my screen share with a bit of luck. There we go. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about New Zealand. It's a place that I have had a long connection with, as you have said, Paul. Uh, I left Canada at the end of my time as a graduate student to take my first job at the University of Canterbury. Uh, that was in the uh, beginning of 1974, and I taught there for a few years before I came to UBC in 1976. Uh, my wife is from Christchurch. I met her while I was teaching at the University of Canterbury. Uh, as a consequence, we made fairly frequent trips back. Uh, while her parents were alive, she still has family down there. And uh, since the early 2000s, uh, first our daughter and then our son uh, attended Teachers College in New Zealand. And our daughter remained there. So we've had continuing reason to go back and forth over the last, what is it now, 50 years almost. And... During my time at the University of Canterbury, I did start to do some research on New Zealand. I thought I was going to be staying longer than, in fact, I did, but the attractions of UBC lured me away. Um, and I've continued some of that research over the years. So my connection with the place is both long and complicated, because in some ways, I suppose I can present myself as a scholar of New Zealand things, environmental and historical. Uh, as a geographer, I have a fascination with landscapes wherever I travel and try to understand something about how they came to be. And as uh, the spouse of a New Zealander and the father of a New Zealand citizen now, uh, and a granddaughter uh, living in Christchurch, I uh, visit as a family member and we do some traveling. Uh, we still have friends scattered through the country. So uh, this is not your average tourist uh, visit to New Zealand, uh, although I will begin by saying a few things about the trip that we took on our most recent visit, which began in April of this year. So here is the itinerary. The trip that I'll begin with uh, is associated with the Northern Explorer train journey uh, from Wellington to Auckland. That train runs back and forth and al on alternate days, uh, Auckland, Wellington, Wellington, Auckland. Uh, and we took the northward journey from Wellington to Auckland, and I'll open with that. Uh, we then went on to the Bay of Islands, which is uh, north of Auckland, which is here. I should say Wellington is down there on the right-hand map, Auckland up the uh, North Island, and then the Bay of Islands, uh, which we visited, is in this area. Then we returned and spent a few days on Waiheke Island, which is in the Gulf here between Auckland and the Coromandel Peninsula. So this northern trip was in a, a very real sense a piece of tourism. Uh, neither my wife nor I had taken the train uh, either way, so that was new. 
uh, but we had both visited the Bay of Islands. Uh, Waiheke Island was also a new experience. So after the tourism bit of this, I suppose, uh, we'll jump across Cook Strait to the South Island and uh, the base for our stays is generally Christchurch. Uh, so I know the Canterbury Plains quite well. Um, and I will talk about various locations in the South Island around uh, a number of themes. But the second, third part of what I want to talk about really is uh, the destruction and reconstruction of Christchurch after the tragic and de devastating earthquake sequences uh, that hit the city and Canterbury in 2010 and 11. So we'll deal with that and then a short concluding section where I raise a question that in a way is implicit through much of what I will be saying today, uh, which is always, uh, I guess, a recommendation to uh, look beneath the surface and think about what it is that one is being presented with. So let me move on immediately to the Northern Explorer. Uh, New Zealand really has a very heavy level of dependence on its tourism economy. And uh, they have developed a number of what they call Great Journeys New Zealand uh, by uh, trains uh, in both the North and South Island. The Northern Explorer is perhaps the longest of those journeys and the most promoted of them. Uh, there's a little bit of the promotion here from their website. If you want to see more about the opportunity of this trip, uh, it's greatjourneysnewzealand.com. But uh, here the journey highlights as described uh, struck me as being you know, a little bit of overselling. Uh, which is not to say that I didn't enjoy the, the journey at all. But uh, here we will be soaring over the icy mountain streams, meandering alongside the white cliffs, clinging to the cliffs on the Kapiti coast, and enjoying intimate views of rural New Zealand. It certainly has astonishing scenic landscapes, but I'm not sure about how intimate the views are when you're rattling along in a train. And uh, so the, the sense that this promotion gives, I think is a little bit hyperbolic, uh, but so be it. Let's begin our journey. Let's explore the Northern Explorer. As I said, we begin in Wellington. Uh, the building on the left, you can see in the early, early morning sunlight is no known as the Beehive. It's the uh, government offices for New Zealand, and it's in very close proximity to the railway station in Wellington. Uh, we flew up from Christchurch, spent a night in Wellington, and then the next morning at uh, eight o'clock boarded the train. Uh, you had to be there half an hour early to stow bags and so on. But uh, off we took as the train pulled out of the station. And the journey is certainly varied and intriguing. Uh, this is approximately the first 90 minutes of that trip. And uh, here you can see something of the variety. Uh, I've put little time signals up at the, uh, the top of these pictures so that you can get some sense of our clattering through a variety of scenery. Sorry, I should go back there. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out here is that as you travel on the North Island, heading north along the so-called Carpety Coast, uh, you can see the South Island, and here I'm pointing it out in the 834 uh, slide. Uh, this is across the Cook Strait, uh, this, this edge of the Southern Alps at the northern end of the South Island. So uh, there is a 
a trick question about where, uh, you know, which way you travel when you're heading from Wellington to the ferry port in the South Island, and it's not actually south. Uh, but as we go on up the coast, uh, the Carpety Coast, there is this uh, spectacular view of uh, Carpety Island here, which gives the coast its name. It's one of the volcanic cones that forms part of the rim of the Pacific Rim of Fire, which is still active in part. Uh, this is a volcanic cone, and there are a number of those scattered around as islands offshore from the North Island. Uh, White Island uh, further north is still active, uh, but there are a number of extinct volcanic cones as well, uh, such as Great Barrier uh, and the like. But this is a much revered view among New Zealanders. Uh, and so we progress and uh, an hour, less than an hour and a half outside of uh, the station in Wellington, uh, I looked around and I discovered that most of the people on this exciting journey where we were supposed to be hanging uh, from bridges and looking down on streams and suspending ourselves from cliffs were in fact asleep and some of them had taken it so seriously that they put on eye masks. So I was very interested in the journey and the scenery, but I can't say the same for most other people on the train, unfortunately. Uh, there were a number of folks who were very keen on using the observation cars and taking pictures such as these of the landscape that we passed through. In essence, uh, what happens on this journey is that you skirt the coast, as I have just shown, coming out of Wellington, and then you move inland and travel northwards on this uh, route to Palmerston North uh, in the Manawatu, where there's a lots of good farming country. You're climbing gradually through most of the time, and we can see both a summary of the route of the train here with the main stops and the more detailed route through on this other map. Here's Palmerston North. The most recent set of pictures were taken just about here. As the train moves along this route here, it approaches the, the sort of center of the volcanic plateau so-called and there are three important mountain rain, mountain volcanic cones here uh, mount tongariro this is the national park uh, around mount tongariro uh, ruapehu and narahoe are also in this vicinity and you get very good views of those as you move northwards uh, at some points and on good days it is possible, I'll just go back, sorry. Uh, at some points and good days, it is possible to see across to uh, Mount Taranaki, uh, formerly Mount Egmont. Uh, Richard Stokes had a wonderful picture of uh, Mount Taranaki in his talk at the University Women's Club the other day. Uh, I once spent a full week in Stratford, which is just about here, on a field trip with a class from the University of Canterbury, and never saw uh, what was then Mount Egmont at all, because we were socked in by cloud and rain. So I appreciated your picture, Richard. Uh, I have actually seen Mount Taranaki since, and we didn't really see it on this journey. But here we are moving up the volcanic plateau and the first of the, the major volcanic peaks one sees is Mount Ruapehu, which is right here in the lower illustration. And then I've borrowed these pictures from elsewhere because the trio of mountains, uh, Tongariro, which gives the national park its name, uh, Narahoe, which is this peak here, and Ruapehu are located in an approximate triangle at the center of the National Park. Uh, but for fans of the Lord of the Rings uh, film series, this uh, is Narahoe. Uh, it was renamed Mount Doom in the Lord of the Rings. 
and it's one of a dozen or 15 celebrated sites in New Zealand that is now uh, part of uh, a sort of tourist itinerary for people who are lords of Lord of the Rings aficionados. Uh, this website details the 15 uh, sites that have been picked out as major filming locations. Uh, and the picture in the top right, an old black and white illustration of Narahoe from 1909, uh, just reminds us that this was a, a feature of doom even a century or more bef before Peter Jackson discovered it. The Northern Explorer follows the line of what is called the North Island Main Trunk Line of the railroad. And this was pushed through in the late 19th century and completed, uh, I think, in 1904. It was a major engineering achievement at the time, uh, part of a, a scheme by one of the politicians, the Minister of the Interior, effectively, to try and generate development in the interior of the North Island. Uh, it was horrendously expensive and also, in parts, exceedingly difficult. And a consequence of the engineering challenge was the solution that is known and used to this day as the Rurimu spiral. And this is just a, a brief commentary on that spiral. It is to carry people, carry the train down from the rather precipitous edge of the volcanic plateau. Uh, they thought that it would be almost impossible to run the north-south route until an engineer came up with this very cunning scheme, which basically was to uh, allow the train to move on a fairly manageable gradient through a circuitous route that involved a couple of tunnels back underneath the line here and then out along in a big horseshoe bend and on northwards. The distance from Ruarimu, this little settlement here, which gives the tunnels and the spiral its name, and National Park, Mount Tang Tongariro, is about five kilometers, just a little over five kilometers. Uh, the train through this circuitous route takes about 11 kilometers of rail to transgress that space. So uh, this is one of the places where, you know, people hang out of the observation cars, as I did, to get a picture of the train curving around the bends and moving forward uh, through the countryside. Uh, this picture with the title An Engineering Masterpiece is in fact taken from the uh, observation car where there is this poster which alerts everyone to the engineering marvel that is the uh, Ruarimu spiral. So having gone through the spiral, we then move on through some really fascinating New Zealand farming landscapes. Uh, these are fairly characteristic of the North Island. Uh, I used to kid my New Zealand colleagues when I was teaching down there. Uh, they often used to boast about the productivity of New Zealand farming. And uh, one measure of this was the carrying capacity of sheep per acre or hectare. And I would insist that really they were cheating. Uh, because a large part of the sheep population is in the North Island, and the North Island landscape, uh, a product of uh, volcanic activity and, and also uh, uplift through the confluence of the plates, uh, uh, is a very wrinkled and crenulated landscape. And so I, my argument, tongue-in-cheek, was that uh, of course, the productivity of sheep per acre was high because the acres were measured vertically uh, on a flat surface. And in fact, there were all of these wrinkled parts to the landscape that allowed much more grass to grow than in places where 
you know, the land was actually much closer to being flat. But anyway, here we are moving through this landscape. Uh, one of the striking contrasts that intrigued me, and partly because I have done some work on uh, forestry and the clearing of the New Zealand bush, was the contrast that was so evident on this trip between the native bush, which we see resplendent really here in the top left illustration, uh, a very intricate and attractive mix of indigenous species, uh, all with uh, indigenous Maori names, Tawa, Rimu, Rata, Matai, Totra, and so on, a, a very uh, structured, layered forest with the Totara being the, the forest giants, as it were, and the ferns providing uh, a lower layer, uh, lots of, not so much in this area, but in more profuse parts of the forest, lots of epiphytes uh, hanging from the higher, higher elevations. This is really a very fascinating mix of vegetation. Uh, and it is an intricately layered um, forest structure. As you can see from the caption here, uh, this has been subject to a good deal of uh, assault over the years. The Maori who came to New Zealand uh, perhaps a little over a thousand years ago uh, reduced the area of this forest, people estimate by something under 7 million hectares. Uh, rather more was destroyed by Europeans in a century after 1820, and only about 23% of the native forest uh, of New Zealand is now native forest. Uh, estimates of the original forest are somewhat speculative but this is a very considerable reduction over time. In the North Island, uh, as the railway was being built and settlers were being encouraged to occupy uh, the land, there was a, a horrendous assault on the forest, which involved uh, a whole series of, of tactics, but burning was probably first and foremost among them. So much of this forest was destroyed by burning. Uh, much of the land that was cleared and sown to grass proved to be uh, rather unsuitable for farming, either lacking in nutrients or too steep to be stable. And so in time, there was a move to reforest this with commercial forest plantations. And these plantations known as exotic plantations in New Zealand because they are very largely constitute, constituted of a single imported species, radiata or Monterey pine, uh, can dominate large areas of the landscape. And we see one of those to the right. Um, exotic, of course, is a technical term in this context, uh, meaning that the the tree species were brought into New Zealand, that they're not native to that area. But uh, as I look at these forests, I think of the plantations as anything but exotic in the popular sense of that term, um, implying a kind of fascinating uh, difference um, because they're all so similar and they lack the the aesthetic appeal, to my eyes at least, of the native bush. They're also, of course, much more impoverished in terms of biodiversity, which is a growing concern these days. Now, we took this Northern Explorer train trip, as I said, uh, in April, and that is in the fall season in New Zealand. So the days were growing shorter. And although we left Wellington at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, by about five o'clock, the uh, light was shrinking and the train takes uh, 11 hours to reach Auckland. So as we approached Hamilton and ran alongside the 
the very large Waikato River, uh, dusk was beginning to envelop the landscape. And I think one of the disappointing facets of the trip was that uh, essentially the last two hours were run through increasing darkness into Auckland. That's a matter of choice, of course. If we'd gone in the summer, we would have had uh, the view. Uh, if you're going in April, I would suggest that, in fact, going north to south is better than south to north because beyond Hamilton, uh, one runs basically through flat dairy farming country that is not the most interesting scenically in the world and uh, then into the outer suburbs, the endless outer suburbs of sprawling Auckland. But before dark enveloped us, we did see the Waikato River and we ran by Huntley Power Station, power station. the thermal power station that has actually had a rather contested history in New Zealand, uh, because as you can see, it's a major generator of greenhouse gas emissions uh, accounting for uh, a considerable proportion of electricity emissions in New Zealand as a whole. Uh, this power station depends on natural gas extracted from the Maui gas field, which is off Taranaki, uh, close by Mount Egmont or Mount Taranaki, and that is piped 300 kilometers in a pipeline across to the Waikato River, to the power station. And some of the production of electricity is also from coal. And there are local supplies of coal, but not of sufficient quality always. So coal is imported from Indonesia. So this is a major generator of emissions carbon emissions. Uh, environmentalists have been protesting it for some time. Uh, in 2006, its closure was recommended by 2015. Uh, in 2016, the company that operates it, a company that is more than 50% owned by the New Zealand government, announced that coal would in fact be phased out with the caveat, except in times of unmet uh, unsupplied demand by 2025. Uh, last year, the station began an experiment with biofuels using wood pellets, uh, but this was a pretty late reaction. And in fact, the, li the license to operate, the consent for this station runs until 2037. So I suspect that it will probably continue to operate much as it has, perhaps with more biofuel, uh, because it is a major supplier to the growing industrial and uh, suburban spreading city of Auckland. And it's hard to see where the power supply could be met otherwise. Uh, there, there are a number of hydroelectric dams on the Waikato River, uh, but Huntley, I think, is not going anywhere soon. Anyway, here we are. This is a borrowed shot, obviously, because we arrived in Auckland in the dark. Uh, this is from the train publicity. Uh, because it's a diesel train, it does not run into the central Brito Mart station of Auckland, which is down by the central business district and the uh, waterfront keys where ferries run every which way, uh, but it stops a little bit short. That's not all that inconvenient. It's, as you can see, very close to the downtown core. And so uh, we were able to find an overnight accommodation, um, really only about 10 or 15 minutes walk away. Although uh, Auckland is, a pretty hilly place and we took an uber rather than hauled our bags up the steep slope to the hotel but 
on balance, I would say this was a journey well worth taking. Uh, I really enjoyed not having to keep my eyes on the road and to be able to look at the landscape through the windows and the open carriage and just generally enjoy the variety of scenery. Uh, we actually had a not bad day for the trip. Uh, as you can see from the photographs, there were periodic storms, but uh, overall, I would give this uh, a pretty decent grade, although perhaps not quite as exciting as the publicity suggested. So after an overnight in Auckland, we headed northwards up to the Bay of Islands, which is just here. It's an easy drive up the main highway and uh, the best way of getting to the town of Russell, long so-called, uh, but increasingly now referred to as Kororarika, uh, the traditional Maori name for the place, uh, is by taking the short ferry. Uh, you can drive around a back road uh, and get onto the peninsula uh, on which Kororarika sits, but it's a very long route around. Uh, the ferry just dips across here, and the route around is a very bad road, uh, really, through this way. So, uh, here we are, the Bay of Islands, renowned among yachtsmen the world over, I think, a major site for sailing holidays and recreation in sail and other boats. Uh, the Bay of Islands is the name applied to the area by Captain Cook, who came in 1769 when he mapped much of New Zealand. Uh, the Maori name for this area and Maori were fairly densely settled around the inlets uh, of the area uh, is P. Fairangi. And there is a long history of this area as the center of encounter between Europeans and Maori people. Uh, Captain Cook was perhaps the first to put into this inlet or inlets for any length of time. Uh, he was quickly followed by whalers, people in search of whales for oil and, and other products in the late 19th, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries. And Kororarika was uh, notorious as the hellhole of the South Pacific because it was one of the bases for the whaling ships and their crews who cut loose in no uncertain fashion after their dangerous work in the Southern Ocean uh, capturing whales. Uh, the encounter with Maori then uh, continued and intensified uh, through the late 18th century and into the 19th. And uh, much of that contact occurred in uh, Pifairangi, but there were other whaling stations in the South Island as well. Uh, and so this was a, a major source of influence on the Maori population. But Russell and the settlement just across the water here, uh, Waitangi, uh, are at the center of New Zealand's history of contact and encounter. And I'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, we found a very nice accommodation, a bed and breakfast uh, place uh, just outside of the town of Russell. Uh, this was where breakfast was served on one fine day. Uh, you can see that it was uh, a lovely spot. And there are many of these, and the Bay of Islands really is a spectacularly beautiful uh, piece of the, the earth, uh, full of little coves and fine beaches, uh, profuse vegetation, 
and uh, of course steeped in history. And the popular accounts of New Zealand history uh, sort of make much of the fact that uh, the contest between Maori and uh, European settlers was sort of worked out in the 1840s uh, with the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi and then the skirmish between uh, the British government in Russell and local Maori, of whom Honiheke is uh, renowned uh, because the British erected this flagpole and Honiheke and his uh, uh, associates chopped it down a few times. And this led to a major skirmish in the 1840s between British troops and, and Maori. Uh, but as so often, this is a rather simplified story of the encounter. It is certainly a story that warrants explanation and engagement, uh, but as this set of pictures of the, the Anglican Church in Russell try to demonstrate, uh, the story was not entirely straightforward. Honiheke was certainly celebrated by some among Maori for his attack on the flagpole, but uh, Tamati Wakanene uh, was in some ways a rival of Honiheke's, uh, an alter uh, chief from a, an, another local iwi or, or tribe, and he had a much more ambiguous uh, position than Honiheke's hard line, uh, negotiated with the British and, and uh, you know, here he is commemorated in the graveyard of the churchyard. We'll come back to that story in just a moment. But Russell is, I would say, a lovely spot to visit. If you're going to the Bay of Islands, I would suggest it's much more an attractive location to stay than Pahia, which is the popular tourist uh, destination just across the inlet, very close to the Treaty of Waitangi grounds. Uh, it's very easy to get by ferry from this pier, which is uh, in Russell, across to Pahia. The ferry runs pretty regularly through the day and into the early evening. So uh, my recommendation would definitely be Russell rather than uh, Pahia. But the Waitangi Treaty Grounds are without doubt worth a visit. Uh, the top left illustration is of the Treaty House. Uh, the bottom left, uh, bottom right illustration, sorry, is of the, uh, the cultural center, the, the Maori uh, Marae that is on the Treaty Grounds where there are uh, cultural performances for visitors. And this is a sacred ceremonial site for Maori. Uh, and since I first visited there in the 1970s, they have built a really spectacular museum commemorating uh, the Treaty of Waitangi and the encounter between Europeans, British and Maori. Uh, so this museum I think is really exceptional in treating the contact period um, in a nuanced and uh, revealing way as these uh, pieces of, of text which are spliced together from pictures I took in the museum suggest uh, what the story the museum tells about contact period is that this was an encounter that brought together peoples who had come an awful long way to find themselves in this territory, uh, that the pace of these encounters increased, but that they're each of the, the groups, the, the settlers, the Pakiha, the white people, and the Maori were intrigued by each other's resources and technologies and cultures, and that there was a good deal of well-intentioned exchange. And 
maybe the story that I told in Russell, the popular story, uh, can be fleshed out a little bit by some of the material here from the museum. Uh, Hongi Heki and uh, another chief uh, of the Waikato people uh, traveled, in fact, to England to meet with King George in the 1820s. And uh, so the story goes, when they were given their audience with the king, um, Hongi Heki and Waikato said, how do you do, Mr. King George? And King George replied, how do you do, King Waikato and uh, King Heki, King Hongi? Uh, so, you know, this was an, ex an expression of the, the different ways in which this kind of intrigue and contact was worked out. And the atrocious alliance story down below that is really a recognition that uh, Maori were concerned to reach a relationship with the British crown that would prevent the kind of adventitious recruitment of passing ships to carry war parties of North Island Maori to the South Island uh, to, 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 to participate in wars and massacres of their South Island brethren. And so this was one of the stimuli that led the North Island Maori in particular to agitate for the Treaty of Waitangi in 1840. We were in the Waitangi Treaty Grounds in a couple of days before the 25th of April, which is Anzac Day in New Zealand and Australia, a commemoration of the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, uh, especially of its heroic uh, efforts at Gallipoli in the First World War. Uh, there was a Maori battalion involved in Gallipoli, and every year there is on the treaty grounds a commemoration of the losses suffered by the Maori battalion in New Zealand involvement in wars. And uh, here the military are beginning to lay out the the crosses that were um, that are displayed uh, as the center of the commemoration in uh, on on Anzac Day uh, every year. This is a celebration that takes place everywhere across the country, as we will see. But we left the north and moved back to Auckland to take the fast catamaran over to Waiheke Island, catching on the way another view of one of these uh, volcanic islands. This one emerged from the sea only relatively recently. Uh, you can visit there. It's not all that well vegetated, uh, but it is a reserve that people can uh, spend a day or so hiking uh, and exploring the aftermath of vegetation colonization of a volcanic cone. Waiheke Island is famous in New Zealand as a very high-end uh, recreational area and producer of some of the finest wines produced in New Zealand. Uh, we had a very comfortable little piece of accommodation uh, just above Little Onoroa Beach, and this was the the accommodation and the view therefrom. Uh, unfortunately, the weather was not that great, but we were able to get around and about and explore. And it's easy to see why this is a much enjoyed holiday location. Um, terrific beaches. Um, good restaurants, uh, fine pieces of, of artwork, uh, a cute little village, the town of Onoroa, uh, which is the main service center for the town, and lots of uh, wineries and very good restaurants. Um, this is the weather that we had, and uh, we, sorry, I keep doing this. 
this is the weather we had, and uh, we took retreat in one of the the several wineries and had a very nice lingering lunch in a in a lovely setting. But here we are back in Christchurch. This is really the reason that we were on this trip. Uh, our granddaughter and me just about to set out for a cycle ride. Uh, the next day was Anzac Day, and here is the marching parade and the annual service in the seaside suburb of New Brighton. So this is a really important day. They say that Vimy Ridge was the sort of creation of Canadian identity, uh, while Anzac Day serves some of the same purposes for Australia and New Zealand. But look, I indulged myself too long and bored you uh, silly so far, so I'm going to move very quickly through these uh, southern sites. Uh, uh, here we are with Christchurch and the view of the Southern Alps in the background with the intervening plains of agricultural and farming land, but everywhere across the Canterbury Plains and beyond, um, places well, well worth a visit, enormously diverse scenery, uh, of course, I couldn't go by this talk without producing at least one picture of, of the standard New Zealand encounter with flocks of sheep uh, holding up traffic on the roads. But uh, that is less common today than it used to be because the sheep population has declined as cattle farming for dairy products has become more frequent. Uh, beyond the landscapes, let me just say that some of the things that we have enjoyed in our visits to New Zealand are visits to gardens, uh, hiking, cycling, and uh, I'll just run through some of these sorts of uh, indulgences fairly quickly. Uh, I could say a good deal more about each of these, but just revel in the, the sort of delights of these uh, show gardens, as it were, and recognize that gardening is a major uh, affection of New Zealanders. Many farmsteads have uh, spectacular gardens. So uh, we, Barbara knew uh, the owners of, or knows the people who used to run this uh, farm uh, on the Canterbury Plains, and they developed this really spectacular garden, as have many other farm families. Of course, having Heavy equipment, backhoes and so on, allows for uh, relatively easy, cost-free excavation of ponds and landscaping and so on. But some of these places are really remarkable. Hiking is spectacularly available. Uh, there are some wonderful walks that are within an easy day's reach of Christchurch, uh, I sort of stepped out of a place we were staying one day and walked up the volcanic hills that separate Christchurch from Littleton Harbour, uh, walking through tussock grassland to encounter this view, and uh, a day trip up the mountains uh, in the Southern Alps. This is Arthur's Pass running through to the West Coast. Uh, a hike around the edge of uh, Littleton Harbour again here and into the uh, beach forests of the, the South Island. Loads of opportunity and spectacular country. The same is true with cycling. I have not completed these uh, Otago cycle trails, but they're the most famous. They have really invested a great deal in promoting uh, the conversion of old rail tracks to cycle routes, so they're usually fairly flat. Um, the Otago Rail Trail is uh, about a three or four day ride. You can do the Lake Dunstan ride, which is a new one down here in the bottom right, uh, constructed uh, on a man uh, above a man made lake with this kind of roadway clinging to the cliffs. Uh, so lots of variety and opportunities. And of course, the South Island famous for its wineries as well. So 
uh, from the north of the South Island through to Otago, uh, lots of, of spectacular scenery and wonderful wines and fine restaurants to enjoy both. But I did want to say a little bit about Christchurch and the earthquakes, because this has been the center in so many ways of my times in New Zealand, a place that I uh, knew quite well from living there in the 70s, and a place that was transformed in 2010 and 11 by uh, two major earthquakes and an incredible number of aftershocks, uh, about 60,000 in 16 months after the first of the big quakes in 2010. The consequences were dire. Uh, 10,000 dwellings were declared unfit. Most of the downtown was destroyed. Uh, this was a downtown that I found fascinating in the 1970s because it was a museum of late 19th century Italianate and Gothic architecture, the Gothic in the religious and government buildings, the Italianate in the commercial buildings. And here, uh, just a, 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 a small sample of some of this architecture, most of which persisted and in, into the late 20th century. Uh, of course, there were uh, demolitions and replacements, but so much of the fabric of Christchurch, even in the 21st century, the, the beginning years of this millennium, uh, was dominated downtown by this sort of Italianate architecture. But then the quake sequences put a rapid and devastating end to that. Essentially, these brick buildings built in the late 19th century uh, crumbled away, and most of them had to be demolished. The, the Gothic cathedral uh, fell apart big time, and the roads, because Christchurch is built on outflow materials, uh, roads and gardens uh, were turned into a slurry, uh, liquefaction that buried properties popped up through toilets and basement cracks and generally made an unseemly mess of everything. Most of the uh, sewage and water supply uh, buried under the roadways or underground was destroyed by the quake and endless numbers of houses, 10,000 in all, were declared uninhabitable. Not surprisingly, 50,000 people uh, left Christchurch in the immediate aftermath of the uh, earthquakes. And so there was the challenge of how to rebuild. The government stepped in, and this is a long and contested story, but the government stepped in and remember that New Zealand is a small country and the cost of recovery was going to be absolutely huge and insurance companies were recalcitrant about paying up. Uh, so the government sidelined the local authorities to a very considerable de decree, degree and established this uh, very formal plan for the reconstruction of Christchurch. Uh, what they did was to emphasize the River Avon uh, running through the river as an, a major resource. By and large, the city had ignored the river uh, up until that point. But then they also decided that they were going to create precincts. So there were areas of this four square grid uh, that were devoted, for example, to the uh, sports center uh, stadium just outside the central area. Uh, here, there was a massive convention center a new library, uh, and so on. And so here we see what has been erected in the last, what is now a dozen years. It's still in progress. The sports center is not yet complete down here. Uh, the convention center, which is enormous and spectacular, has 
uh, just opened uh, the library, which is much smaller uh, and relatively modest, but uh, gloriously designed and fully in touch with the kinds of needs of a modern library is, I think, a, a, a significant triumph. I'm not sure how effective the convention center is going to be as we wrestle with the uh, environmental consequences of long distance flying and so on. Uh, it's one of those places that is designed to hold thousands of people. But the reconstruction of the centers, as you can see, has taken a long time. And uh, here the cathedral is still, after 12 years of furious debate about what should become of it, and half the associated population arguing for its demolition and the other half saying it had to be restored as it had been before, uh, it's now going to be restored at enormous cost. Uh, but there are still any number of blank spaces, but there are also some considerable achievements. The, the river corridor has, through the center has been really well designed and dressed up uh, with everything from uh, a rather attractive riverside market through to a children's playground and lots of opportunities for cycling and walking through some very attractive spaces. Uh, around the major retail and cultural and convention center sort of precincts, the idea was that there should be higher density housing built in a city where at one time, most people lived on a quarter acre of land uh, in single family houses. Uh, so this building, which is meant to frame the central business district is as you can see being touted as central city living. Um, it's going up gradually. I understand that there have been all sorts of financial difficulties. Uh, people, developers have been loath to pursue development at the speed that was hoped for uh, because the uptake of units is not as rapid as they would have liked. But beyond the center, there is this enormous area known as the red zone uh, where houses had to be demolished, 10,000 in all, uh, through this enormous area of uh, uncompacted silts and and uh, sediments along the the river uh, and this is a major ongoing concern it's in many ways a most poignant landscape you can see here this entire area was once uh, as densely occupied as this uh, here it is from the ground uh, streets the remnants of property lines marked by the vegetation but nary a house in sight. Uh, still debate about what will be done, reserves for native uh, birds and life, uh, wildlife um, being promoted, but let's just see what this really means in, in terms of the landscape. Here is one example. Uh, a densely occupied suburb, the place, a place where people invested hopes and dreams and a lot of money to acquire their, their properties, uh, now reduced to empty open space. And many of those people still fighting for the compensation that they think is due. All of this has had considerable effect. We all know what these are. They're of course Canada geese, and they have become a plague in Christchurch because Canada geese spend their uh, days gobbling up worms, as it were, from the grass. And the red zone has turned into a green zone insofar as all those demolished properties have been replaced by greensward. So there are flocks and flocks, hordes and hordes of Canada geese now plaguing the city of Christchurch because they have no predators and they're, they're happily grazing away. Um, by the same token, 
uh, there were introduced p- pigeons in New Zealand, rock pigeons, brought in by uh, settlers who wanted to have racing pigeons or because they thought that they were redolent of the old country. Many of those pigeons nested in the cliffs uh, here in the central illustration, but those cliffs fell down in 2010-11, and so the pigeons had to find a new place to live. They're not at all slow, these birds. There was this empty cathedral that was just like the cliffs, really, and so they moved in there in droves. Uh, The cathedral was fenced off. It rapidly uh, became filled up with guano, pigeon droppings, and uh, for a while it might have been described as the largest aviary in the southern hemisphere. But then reconstruction started and uh, the roof was put on, so the pigeons had to find somewhere else to go. And so they transported themselves across to an area of indigenous native bush in uh, a suburb of Christchurch called Ricketon Bush. Uh, This is protected by a predator fence and uh, traps inside to keep out rats and and other predators of native bird life, most of which, much of which is flightless. And uh, the pigeons moved in there and it too began to fill up with guano. Uh, The curator of the bush went into all sorts of uh, research to try and figure out how to deal with this infestation of rock pigeons, the feces of which are both uh, dangerous because they plop onto the sidewalk and um, poisonous to much uh, of the indigenous uh, bird life. And they talked about putting snakes or artificial snakes in the treetops to scare off the pigeons. But that was both expensive and difficult and might also have scared off visitors. So they turned away from that. Um, They now, the curator of the bush, the warden ranger tells me, um, cull the pigeons quietly at night or sometimes not so quietly because uh, on occasion they shoot them. But in 2022, they killed over 3,000 pigeons and they still have a problem. So uh, there are all sorts of unforeseen consequences that flow from the earthquake, not just the massive financial costs and the disruptions to lives, but uh, in all sorts of ways, uh, these ecological consequences that I was just talking about are a reminder of the way in which you know, life is lived in uh, a web of relationships. And although New Zealand promotes itself as clean, green New Zealand, I think we need to be a little cautious of that, just as I was perhaps a little cautious or skeptical of the promotional claims of the uh, Great Northern Railroad. Uh, Here in the center of Christchurch in the square, just outside of where the cathedral is re-rising, is this cairn, which is intended to be like all cairns. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, Be like all cairns um, to remind people of the kinds of challenges that are being faced. The switch to dairying in Canterbury has meant that Massive irrigation has been developed. Uh, Vast numbers of cows have been put onto what were formerly sheep pastures. Uh, The nitrate load in the rivers and streams and in the groundwater has shot up. And there is a really serious problem uh, uh, from this farming development. But so much money has been invested uh, in developing the Central Plains water uh, system that uh, no one has really been prepared to pull the plug uh, on these uh, impending ecological disasters. But I'm sorry, I have uh, run a little over the hour here. So let me leave it there. And uh, thank you all for attending. Well, thank you very much, uh, Graham. A most educational and interesting talk, different from the usual touristic talk as you said at the onset. 
Could I ask you now to stop sharing your screen if you still are screen sharing? Yep, screen? yep. I'm not doing that anymore as far as I know. Okay. Then I'm going to view the gallery and see if there are any people who would like to either comment or ask you questions. You can unmute yourselves and uh, speak if you wish. I know there are a number of people here who have been to New Zealand and talked about New Zealand in the past, and some who are from New Zealand. Well, thank you, Graham. Um, I just have a question. I was wondering, what is the history of earthquakes there in the vicinity of Christchurch? And are they expecting more with all this rebuilding and so on? How often does this happen? Well, the, there is a low, a low level of sort of background earth movement uh, throughout New Zealand um, because it is part of the Pacific Rim of Fire. Um, and we're here in the west coast of North America, also a part of that uh, circum-Pacific set of, of uh, fault lines and volcanic activity. Uh, but generally, the the movements, the quakes, have been relatively low magnitude. Mm -hmm. uh, the The Southern Alps, the spine of the South Island, are caused by the same process of plate tectonics as gives us the mountain ranges here in British Columbia, uh, a subduction as one plate moves beneath another and tends to lift up the, the plate that it is sliding under. So this this is a not a smooth movement. It creates tension, which builds up and then releases. So New Zealanders have always reckoned that there was a big one coming, as people say in in British Columbia. But the Alpine Fault is uh, pretty much in the center of the Southern Alps, and the two Christchurch earthquakes uh, were actually very close to Christchurch. Uh, one on a fault that had never been identified or mapped previously, um, and the other uh, very close to the surface, um, actually not very far from the center of the city, hard up against the Port Hills, which, although it was lower magnitude, kind of amplified the effect of the shock. So um, these this was a double whammy that was you know, uh, orders of magnitude greater than the the recurrent pattern of Earth movement or quakes uh, that is common throughout New Zealand. Barbara recalls, you know, tremors as a as a child growing up in New Zealand. As and I remember from the nineteen seventies experiencing occasional earthquakes, but they were momentary and you know, a certain trembling and shaking without much in the way of damage. Uh, the 2011 quake continued, the earth continued to move for two minutes. So it was very, very frightening. Yeah. I'm going to uh, ask a question that I have received in a chat from Sandra. Is New Zealand able to use tidal power? Uh, I think the answer to that is no. Um, the tides are not, you know, unduly large. I think my own understanding of this is that tidal power is most promising, but hardly yet terribly effective in places where there is a very considerable tidal range. It's, you know, the same as hydro, really. You need a, a head of uh, movement. So there have been experiments in the Bay of Fundy in eastern Canada but uh, New Zealand doesn't have the same kind of configuration that forces um, tides into narrow constrictions and, and thus kind of raises the, the force available. So I think the answer to that in short is no. Thank you. Any other question, Helen? Uh, thank you very much, Graham. Um, it made me feel quite homesick. Um, I, we are from New Zealand originally, and we yes, I know. Last back in November, but every time we go, 
the more and more of the Maori language is just used by the whole population. We find this really interesting. And we think it's easier perhaps in New Zealand because there's a script which people like us can understand. So when we see iwi or whanau, we know what it means in context. We do, nobody has to teach us that. It just naturally happens. Do you have any comment on that? I can only agree. Uh, you know, there's a single language throughout the country, uh, pretty much. And so it's much easier for people to, uh, in a sense, invest in learning the language. There has been a concerted effort to introduce the teaching of elementary Maori in the schools. So anyone who is teaching at the elementary level has to uh, develop a proficiency to teach, you know, basic vocabulary and sentence structure. So there's been a, a major transformation. Uh, in the 1970s, I think you will probably remember uh, from when you were in New Zealand, th there were two solitudes. There, was, there were Maori and uh, Pākehā, and they spoke different languages. Uh, my, my historian friends... Uh, 20 years ago were telling me that you know they no longer thought it was acceptable to be a historian in New Zealand without having a capacity to at least offer the first paragraph or a few sentences of a talk in Maori and and so i think you know because there is a single language for the whole country uh it's it's much more easy for people to see the value of doing the hard work of mm. investing in that. And I'm no linguist, but uh, you know, one of the slides I showed indicated that the first uh, written dictionary of Maori was produced from that visit of Waikato and Hongi Heki to uh, England when they met King George. Uh, they spent a month at Cambridge University uh, working on this with the uh, linguists and translators. Uh, so there has been uh, a written version of Maori which is in a script that is familiar to you know people raised in the in the the Western British tradition, uh, I've I've sometimes asked my linguist colleagues at UBC uh, whether there is, in in a way, an obstacle to the general public um, learning Indigenous languages in Canada when they are represented in these. At initially at least almost uh, arcane and unintelligible linguist scripts which you know cause cause the tongue to freeze or the pronunciation to stumble as you come across you know the the ling the linguistic codings uh, that are so characteristic so I don't know I I am impressed by what New Zealand has done to move towards uh, greater uh, bilingualism in a country that had two languages, but would, those languages were essentially um, spoken in separate communities. And yeah. I agree. Thank you. Judy Hall, please. Graham, thanks so for such a wonderful overview. And um, insight into what's happened and happening in New Zealand. I was struck by um, the train route um, and the, the spiral um, train track. And as you know, um, that was part of the trains that came west in Canada. I happen to have had the opportunity to take a wonderful train trip to Banff and you go through a tunnel that spiral, um, but I think it was before the New Zealand spiral. So I don't know my history well enough, but it was part of the whole Western Canadian movement that was trying to get Canada to, to um, make it to the West Coast before um, the Americans did so that they could keep British Columbia. And do you know the timing, the relative timing of the spirals? Maybe it was our Canadian oh, yeah. spiral. 
Yeah, uh, the the Canadian spiral predates the New Zealand one. Uh, the the rail line crossed the country in 1886. Um, the New Zealand North Island main trunk was not opened until 1904, and it was ten or a dozen years after the first transcontinental ran in Canada that the Ruarimu spiral was designed. So, um, I mean, it's the obvious solution in in a way, but the yeah. look when I arrived in New Zealand in the nineteen seventies, um, it was almost commonplace for New Zealanders to introduce various tourist attractions as one of the wonders of the world. You know, there's the seven <laughs> wonders of the world that we know about. Um, from classic sources uh but you know the funicular railroad that used to serve the collieries the on the coast was the uh, you know was the uh the, a wonder of the world and i i think there's a little bit of that about the Ruarimu spiral uh it's a pretty ingenious solution to some difficult terrain but it's yeah as they say hardly rocket science uh, you know, when we walk up or down a steep hill, we zigzag, right, to reduce the gradient and the strain on our knees or our lungs. Um, and we're essentially taking a longer distance to reduce the incline. And so that's the principle of the spiral. And it's, it's in fact, probably less impressive than a much tighter corkscrew kind of arrangement which would be some engineering feat. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for staying. And uh, it's been a very interesting discussion after excellent talk. Um, before we quit, uh, to let you know that our next meeting will be on November the 23rd. And Linda Wong is going to talk to us about Norway, which is a little bit different from the talks that I think we've had in the last couple of years. So we look forward to having you join us. And again, thanks, Graham, for your efforts today. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.